Hi, welcome to Sunshine Courses. Uh, this is the accounting module on stock. So we're going to cover today the principles behind stock, how we value stock, how we value work in progress. Work in progress is a variant of stock, and we'll explain what that means when we come to it, how we account for it, and then we're going to go through a few practical tips to make this uh, handling stock easier in certain circumstances. So let's start with the stock principles. Stock, remember, is a balance sheet item. And the whole point of stock, as with all balance sheet items, it's a mechanism by which we move payments or costs in one accounting period into a, in which we incur the cost or we pay for it, move it into the period that relates to the sales. So if you remember in previous weeks, we've been talking about a car dealership and we had various costs that were incurred in January. And as it turns out, February and March, and yet all of our sales took place in February. So somehow we had to move costs from January and March, the costs we incurred in January and March, move them to February, so that those costs match against the revenue that they relate to, or in simpler English, that the cars that are sold in February, we account for the costs in February, even if we bought the cars before or afterwards. So stock is just an example of one of these balance sheet items, and we've already touched on it a little bit, but the purpose of this session is to go into stock into quite a bit more detail. And the basic principle is illustrated in this diagram where we have in the three months, uh, January, February, and March, in January, we buy three cars. Note, we only pay for two of them. You might ask, how could that be? Well, we say to our dealer, uh, people who supply us, could you sell us three cars? And they say, sure, pay us in seven days time. And it just happens that we pay for them for two of them. And the third one, we haven't yet reached our seven day period. So we bought them in January. We've only paid for two of them. And then in February, we sell 10 cars. Because we bought three in January, it means we've only got to buy another seven in the month. And as it turns out, we only pay for five cars because we then have, for whatever reason, we managed to delay payment for the other three cars till March. So if you look at the whole period, our revenues, our sales relate to 10 cars, our purchases relate to 10 cars in January and February, and our payments relate to 10 cars in January, February and March. Remember the idea of the balance sheet is it's the mechanism by which you reallocate the costs so that they're in the correct period relative to sales, and the sales accounting period is the period in which you deliver your goods or services. It's the period in which you deliver your goods and services, and we want our costs to match those revenues whenever they're incurred. So when we look at this example in January, we had already bought three, car, three cars. We had those sitting on the forecourt. And at the end of January, we've got no sales, but we have three cars sitting there. And we refer to those three cars as stock. Or if you're talking in an accounting principle term, we've incurred costs, 3,000 pounds, which we haven't yet received the revenue for. So we're gonna carry those costs forward to another accounting period and release those costs in the period in which we received the revenue. So in February, we only bought seven cars, but we were able to sell 10 cars because we had stock of three cars at the beginning of the period. So that's the principle of stock. It's shifting the cost that you incur in one period where you have to buy things to be able to sell them and then allocate them in a different period if you sell them in a different period. In other words, if you have stock at the beginning of your accounting period, this session is all about what that stock is, how you value it and how you account for it. So the first question I want to address with stock is probably one of the most basic stock, which is how do you value stock? 
It seems a pretty obvious question, but as with a lot of accounting, there's a lot more to it when you get into the nitty gritty of accounting. But the general principle of stock is that it's valued at the lower of its cost and net realizable value. Cost is what you buy stock for. So if you've paid a thousand pounds for your car to a dealer, the cost of it, of course, is a thousand pounds. What happens just out of interest, if you pay a thousand pounds to the dealer, you then have to pay someone another hundred pounds to go and collect it and bring it to you. Is that a cost of stock or is that a cost to the business during the month where you just write off to the profit and loss account? Well, the answer to the question is, it's cost of stock. It's the cost, it's all the costs to bring stock to its present location. So that's the cost. And you value stock at its cost, which is what you paid for it, plus any other cost you had to do to bring it to its current state. You can imagine if you're a builder and you bring in I know, various equipment and you start making things, the stock you've got is worth quite a lot more than just the component parts because you've built it and you've put labour in to build it together. So the cost is not necessarily just what you pay for the material. It's whatever you pay to bring stock to its current state and location. But you value it not necessarily at cost. You also you value it the lower of its cost and net realizable value. Now, the idea of net realizable value is to say, look, if you go out and buy some stock, but you can't sell it for as much as you bought it for, you can't carry that cost forward against future revenues because you're never gonna get revenues to cover it. So if you carry the cost forward, all you're doing is artificially ignoring the fact you've already lost money on it. So imagine you buy a car for a thousand pounds. Let's say you bought a petrol car and the government say, right, we're moving to electric cars, no more petrol cars. And that thousand pounds all of a sudden is worth just a hundred pounds, but you haven't sold it. You will be able to sell it for a hundred pounds that's its realizable value. But that 900 pounds, the difference between what you paid for it and what you can get for it is a cost here and now because you'll never get that money back. So you can't carry that forward in stock. And we talk about not realizable value, but net realizable value because we take not just what you get for it, but what you can get for it, what your realizable value, what you sell it for, less whatever it costs you to sell it. So again, imagine you got that car for hundred pounds, but if in order to sell it, you've got to take it to the breaker's yard and they'll pay you hundred pounds for the metal, but for nothing else, but it costs you 70 pounds to take it to the metal, uh, to, to, the, um, to the yard. Well, the actual net realizable value is not hundred pounds, but it's the hundred less 70 pounds that you have to spend to take it there. So 30 pounds. So you have to value stock at the lower of its cost and net realizable value. Um, and as I mentioned, stock includes any goods that are unsold. Um, bit strange, but it also includes any services that you haven't yet been paid for. Seems a bit strange because with services, typically you carry out the service and you get paid for it. Um, imagine you're going to a hairdresser, for example, you go to the hairdresser, you're carrying, they're carrying out a service. What's the stock? How can you carry forward a haircut? Well, you can't carry forward a haircut, but there are some services you can carry forward. As I said, imagine that you've got a, an architect and the architect is designing building work and the architect does it over a two month period. And in the first month, they build up time costs of maybe 10,000 pounds in two months time, they're gonna invoice not 10,000 pounds, but 50,000 pounds. So they'll certainly get the money back, but they can't do it until they finish the project where they've got to spend another, say 5,000 pounds of costs. So the total cost of them will be say 15,000 pounds. Yet, um, it's still service. It's a, it's a drawing service. Uh, so you can have stocks of um, services uh, and we often refer to them as work in progress rather than stock, but it's all the same thing. It's any cost which relates to a future revenue, 
which you want to carry forward to match against that revenue that you spend either on the material or the goods or on creating the service that you're selling. So as I mentioned, costs include all the costs to bring the stock to its present, present location and condition. So that includes transport costs, um, damage, if it's damaged and you have to repair something, that would, that would include that cost as well. It includes all the costs. And net realizable value is the stock of which it can be sold, net of all costs of sale. So again, as I said, if you created, uh, if you bought something which is 90% complete and you're going to lose money on it, but in order to get any money at all, you've got to spend a little bit extra, the additional cost you would have to spend to get it to the state at which you could spend, uh, you could sell it is incorporated in the net realizable value calculation. So that's the principle. Uh, next thing I want to do is to start showing how this works in practice. And as always, uh, I find it a lot easier to see this in the trial balance in the spreadsheet format. But what we'll do is we'll look at the spreadsheet format as well as the uh, computer. We'll have a quick look at the computer format as well. So I'm going to start now with the uh, spreadsheet format. And I'm just going to run through a sort of a quick illustration of how stock works. I filled in the numbers because it's a bit easier to describe than to type it from scratch. But in this particular example, this block here describes what we've actually done, the transactions we've carried out. So in this case, we're just dealing with February and March. So we bought some cars in February. 15th of February, we bought, we bought three cars and each car cost a thousand pounds. So the value of those three cars is 3,000 pounds. And as at the end of February, uh, we still haven't sold those cars. They're sitting on the full cart, that's stock. Then in March, we buy another two cars on the 3rd of March, and they cost us another thousand pounds, in total 2,000 pounds. We then sell some cars. Now the sales price is 1,500 pounds, even though the cost price is a thousand pounds, that's how we're making our profit. But in terms of what we've, the cost of what we've sold, we've sold four cars. So even though we sell it for 1500 pounds, the cost of that stock is not 1500 pounds per car, it's a thousand pounds per car, because that's what we paid for it. So in the stock movements, we show we've sold four cars or we've reduced our stock by four and we've, the cost of those that stock is a thousand pounds so we reduce our stock value by four thousand pounds then on the 10th of march we buy another five cars and on the 15th of march we manage to sell all the cars so the first block is our stock movements what does that relate how does that look in terms of our stock levels overall so this chart here takes the movements and creates a running total so the first purchase, we bought three cars. They cost us a thousand. The stock value of those cars is 3000 pounds. That's what it cost us to bring the cars to their present state, their present location. We then buy another two cars in March, which brings our total from three to five. So we've now got five cars in stock. The stock value as at the third of March is 5,000 pounds. On the 4th of March, we sell four cars. We actually get 6,000 pounds for it because we sell them for 1,500 pounds each, not 1,000 pounds each. But in terms of stock levels, we've reduced our stock by four cars. It cost us, each one cost us 1,000 pounds. Our stock of five has gone down from, by four, from five to one car. The cost per car is 1,000 pounds. Our stock value at the 4th of March is 1,000 pounds. On the 10th of March, we buy another six car, uh, another five cars, brings our stock up to six. And then on the 15th of March, we sell them all and our stock value goes back down to zero. And although this, is, this stock register um, is, is records just for two months, and at the end of March, you end up with no stock at all, typically the stock register goes on indefinitely. And the important part to know is, as at the end of each month, what is your stock value? so that you can account for the movements properly. 
So at the moment, I'm just identifying how you keep track of stock levels. Next thing we're going to talk about is how you account for them. So I just want to illustrate the cash movements, the, ca the entries in the cash book, so that we can then explain how the journals work. So for exactly the same transactions, when we bought the three cars in February, we paid, paid £3,000 and we allocated the double entry is purchases. So that's because we're reducing an asset, a debit or debt, a debit is an asset. So we're reducing an asset, we, asset, we credit bank, we debit purchases, we charge our profit and loss account. In March, we pay out £2,000 for cars. We then sell the four cars for £6,000. We then buy another, spend another £5,000 on cars, and then we can sell, get £9,000 revenue for all of them. And we've done our double entry bookkeeping. So with our sales, we debit bank credit sales for that £6,000. In total for the month, if we do in a spreadsheet format, where we enter is the ent we put through these entries not on a day by day basis or a transaction by transaction basis, as in computer accounting, we're going to put this as a batch total on a month by month basis. The monthly totals we put through are three thousand pounds, which we've allocated to purchases in Mar in February, and a receipt net receipt of eight thousand pounds in the month of March. So I'm now going to show what this looks like in the trial balance, and in the trial balance. In February, we've paid out the £3,000, credit bank, and we've debited uh, costs, purchases. This is not depreciation, apologies. Uh, we've debited purchases. Just double confirm that. We've credited bank, debited purchases. And in the month of March, we debited bank, we received net of £8,000, which was represented by the so debit bank. We credited sales of 15000 because that's how much we got for selling our, our 10 cars at £1,500 each. Less cost, the, the purchase, our cost of £7,000, what we bought in the month. Uh, and again, just to double confirm, just to double check that, our cash book shows that we have received £8,000 and that's represented by sales of £15,000, purchases of £7,000. So on the face of it, if we do, don't do anything to reflect the fact we've got stock, it looks like in the month of February, we've lost £3,000. We've had no revenue and we spent £3,000 on cars. Yep, we have. But actually, instinctively, you can tell we haven't lost £3,000 because we're going to get that money back next month. So if we show a loss of £3,000, and if, for example, a banker looked at these figures or an investor looked at these figures and said, oh, you've lost £3,000, I'm going to close down your banking facilities, you're not very good at business, we'd have actually misled the banker because we haven't lost money. So let's come back to the stock figures. As at the end of February, our stock position is we have £3,000 in stock. And you could have done this in your head, of course. We bought three cars, cost us £1,000 each. They're £3,000. And as it happens, our purchase is £3,000. It's very obvious what the journal should be in this. But of course, if you're dealing with a more sophisticated example, it won't be nearly as, nearly as obvious as that. So somehow you've got to keep track of the stock value. And the journal you put through to correct the position is you're going to move the cost which you've allocated to purchases you're going to move them out of the profit and loss accounts because they don't match against the revenues in February into the balance sheet item of stock. So the journal entry you have is you reduce purchases. Purchases are a debit, so you reduce it, you credit it. And what do you debit? You debit stock. Stock is an asset, you debit stock. So at the end of March, uh, sorry, the end of February rather, we show we've got stock of £3,000. We have an overdraft of £3,000. This is the bank account going negative. And we don't have anything in our profit and loss account because we haven't sold anything yet. Perfect. What about March? On the face of it, again, without any journals, we've sold £15,000 of stock. It only cost us £7,000. So on the face of it, 
we've made a profit of £8,000 in the month of March. But as you know, the reason we only paid £7,000 in March is because we already had £3,000 worth of stock. So if we don't make any journals, it appears that we've made a profit of £8,000 in the month of March, which of course we haven't. It shows that we've got bank accounts of £5,000. Yep, actually we do have £5,000. If, if and when we do our bank reconciliation, that will equal £5,000. But it's also showing that we've got stock of £3,000. Wait a minute. We know we've got zero stock because our stock register shows us that. So clearly there's an error in these accounts at the moment. And the error is that we haven't accounted for the stock movements. And the stock movements are that we released those £3,000 of stock. We sold them in the month. So we have to release those from the balance sheet back to the profit and loss account. And the way we do that with the entry is we reduce stock it's the opposite of a debit or a debtor. It's the opposite of that. We reduce the debit, so we credit it, minus £3,000. And what do we debit? Purchases. And now, in the month of March, we're showing £15,000 sales, £10,000 costs. So we've now got the correct profits in the month of March of £5,000. The correct profits in the month of February of nothing the correct stock at the end of February of £3,000 and nothing at the balance sheet in respect of stock. By simply putting those, that, those journals through, both creating the stock in February and releasing it back again in March, we've done exactly what we wanted to do, which is to reallocate the costs from the period in which they were incurred to the period that matches against the revenue. So you can probably tell the value for stock is critical in knowing what your profits are. You can, never, you can never identify what your profits of a business are without knowing what your stock level is. Now, if you're dealing with high value items, such as a car, where it's quite easy to count the number of items you've got and to see what the costs are, uh, you'll keep a register. There's really no um, substitute for it, and you don't really want a substitute because it's not a lot of work. But imagine this is, so there's a lot of other high value items. Imagine you're a jeweler, for example, and you're buying diamonds, watches, um, earrings. You have relatively few items, but very high values. So you would keep track of them one by one. Uh, but if you have a lot of small value items, imagine you're a, a news agent and you sell lots of sweets, for example, um, or you sell matches, um, uh, plenty of, uh, of retailers. Imagine you're a pound store, for example, where you have lots and lots and lots of very small value items. The cost of keeping track of each stock item individually is quite onerous. So there's a tip as to how you get your stock value at the end of each month. If it's too onerous, to measure, to count the stock, to keep track of the stock on an item by item basis. And so this practical tip is you do something called a stock count. You simply go to the forecourt, count the number of cars you've got and value it. And we'll come to valuation in just a little bit. In this case, it's very easy because we know what the cost of cars are. Uh, but yep, businesses, um, businesses when they're um, doing their accounts which are significant for anybody to understand and to use those accounts, particularly for annual accounts, every business that has stock has to do a stock count. Now, stock counts themselves are a bit painful. You've got to go into the warehouse and write them down, count them. You've got to be very careful counting them because all you need to do is undercount or overcount, write the wrong number down, write 100 instead of 10 or vice versa, and your stock value immediately is wrong. So. Counting stock is not that easy on its own, a lot easier than keeping track of every item individually. If you're dealing with, you know, if you've got a company that sells screws, for example, and they've got 20,000 different types of screw, different sizes of screws, they can't keep track of each screw on an item by item basis. It's impractical. So I'll go through and count them uh, and value them. Um, actually, even the businesses that have those stock registers do stock counts. So even this forecourt, even this, sorry, this car trader would do a stock count, even though it knows what the value of the stock is from its records. 
Why would they do that? Well, it's simply to pick up error. It's so easy to make mistakes in your account by simply having the wrong stock value. If you've got not one item of stock, but say 10 different items of stock, let's say you're selling different types of cars. I mean, one is a, a pretty cheap, inexpensive second-hand car. The other maybe is a Ferrari or a very Mercedes, a very expensive car. Can you imagine what would happen if in your records, you misallocated this purchase from Minis to Mercedes or vice versa? You would dramatically miscalculate the value of your stocks because you made an accounting error. So even in high value items where you keep track of stocks very carefully, every business does a stock count because stock is such a critical item if the business has stock. Certain items, certain businesses don't have stock or they don't have much stock. Coming back to that hairdresser, the vast majority of a hairdresser's revenue comes from cutting hair and carrying out services. And they may have bits of shampoo and other material items that they sell in the shop, but it's pretty insignificant compared with the total value of money going in and out of the till from cutting hair. So uh, in some businesses, stock is much more significant than others, but wherever stock is significant to the account, always do a stock count, whether or not you're keeping the records. But as I said, if you're a business where you're doing loads and loads and loads of relatively small value items, keeping track of stock on an item by item basis is impractical. Doing a stock count at the beginning or the end of the month is all you really need to know to be able to identify your stock levels. And from that alone, you can calculate what your stock levels should be and what your journals need to be to adjust from the opening stocks to your closing stocks. So I've shown this to you with the um, uh, spreadsheet format. I just want to switch now to the computer format. And I'm going to use the KPM accounting software that we've um, we talked about and touched on, on briefly. And in the KPM system, I've pre-entered the transactions that went in the cash book. There's the February purchase, the car purchase. We paid £3,000 for it. Notice in this, I haven't kept track of the stock on an item by item basis. I'm simply entering the cash movements. So I've entered the purchase in February, uh, 15th of February. And then in March, the two further car purchases, the next day in this example, I, I got the day slightly differently, but um, in this example, on the 2nd of March, we sold four cars. We then bought another five cars on the 3rd of March, and we sold the six cars uh, on the 4th of March, all for the same amounts that were in the previous example. So I've already entered those as a journal. And just if you're using KPM, you can do this by going to Quick Entry, click on the plus Quick Entry, and you're Entry form allows you to type in an online by line basis, add a row to enter a new row, and that's how you can enter your cash book. There's other ways of doing it. That's just a quick way of doing it if you're using the system that we were talking about. Let me have a quick look at the profit and loss account for February. Uh, just in case you weren't, weren't aware of it, most um, Computer accounting have a box which gives you a, a, a shortcut to getting typical um, date periods that you might want to do. So typically, the, everything for the current year, everything for the current month, everything for last month, those are typical reports that you want to see. And rather than having to manually type the dates, the beginning date and the end date to, to decide which period that you're reporting on, you can often click these. So I've just clicked the last month which is for the month of February. And in the month of February, our profit and loss accounts shows we've lost 3,000 pounds because we paid 3,000 pounds for the car, but we haven't had any revenues. And clearly that's wrong. And if I look at the current month, again, we've got the same incorrect position. We've got 15,000 pounds of sales, but only 7,000 pounds of purchases. Looks like our gross profit is 8,000 pounds. We've got no operating costs in this example. So our profit in the month of February is 8,000 pounds. 
but it isn't because we haven't accounted for the three thousand pounds we paid in february so how do we put through the journals and it's exactly the same journals we had beforehand we had to journalize the stock and this is how we do so in KPM, if you use non-monetary journals you have to use the formal journal uh, entry and you get to that through the tasks and then there's a journal option so in the journal i've actually pre-fed in um uh, some journals just to make it a bit quicker so i don't have to type everything out one by one and the february journal and i'm just going to uh i'm going to just ignore what i'm just um doing now it's something i did earlier just to save having to type okay so in a february journal what we want to do is to debit stock and credit purchases. We want to debit stock and credit purchases with £3,000. So let's first start entering, typing in uh, apologies for this, the best laid plans. Um, I'm not able to, it doesn't look like I'm, I can edit it. Let's try one more time. If this doesn't work, I'll have to describe it to you. Okay, so what we want to do is to enter stock. There we go. So I typed stock. I've got an entry here for balance sheet stocks. So I'm with my stock, I'm going to uh, debit stock with three thousand pounds and credit purchases. And the crediting the purchases, if you remember, the debit went to purchases when we credited our bank accounts through our cash book. We're going to debit purchases. Uh, we're going to debit stock and credit purchases. Apologies, uh, again, because I pre-entered stuff, uh, I was um, confusing the, the software, so you wouldn't normally have that problem. So I've debited stock, credited purchases for the month of February, and I'm now going to save this journal. And let's have a quick look at the balance sheet, the profit and loss account and balance sheet for February. So again, let me just pick last month. And in the month, you can see there's a net profit of nil, let me look at the balance sheet now. And the balance sheet shows I've got uh, in the ba balance sheet for February, I've got my overdraft for three thousand pounds, and now I've got stock of three thousand pounds. So this is exactly the same as what we saw in the trial balance when we did it with the spreadsheet format. It's just a, just a different way of achieving the same thing. When we look at the March figures, we've still got the error because we haven't yet adjusted for the opening stock. We've still got the eight thousand pounds in March, because if you look at the and if you look at the balance sheet in March, we should have no stock, but we've still got the three thousand pounds in stock because we haven't put through the March journal to reverse the stock entry. So let's do that now. Let's go to tasks journal. I'm going to click on the March journal. I'm going to edit it. I'm going to do just correct, uh, just eliminate what I did beforehand just to, because I had to do something earlier. Okay, and so this time I'm going to debit stock, sorry, credit stock. I'm going to reduce stock by 3,000 pounds. I'm going to reduce it and, and transfer that to purchases where I'm going to debit purchases in this month. So I've credited stock, reduced my stock, debited purchases, created the cost in the current month. And if I save and close this, so I've now entered the transaction. Now let's have a quick look at the balance sheet for March. So the balance sheet for March shows a bank account of £5,000, nothing in stock. As it happens, it's got a net profit of £5,000, which is great because if you now look at the profit and loss accounts, Wonderful. Our sales are fifteen thousand pounds, as they should be. Our purchases are ten thousand pounds, which is the seven thousand pounds we paid in the month, 
plus the £3,000 of stock, which we carried forward from last month, but released this month. So our total cost of sales of £10,000 gives us the profit of £5,000. Now, just because I want to illustrate to you a couple of things with the computerized accounting, I'm going to click on the purchases and get the breakdown of how that £15,000 is made up. And here's a number of entries where it shows how that uh, 15,000 pounds, sorry, shows how the 10,000 pounds is made up. And it shows the original car purchase through the cash book, the journal which removed it in February. So those two are the February figures. And at the end of February, there was nothing there. The 2,000 pounds purchases we made in the month, and plus the 5,000 that we made in the month, plus the 3,000 pounds of stock that was released from the previous month. And that's how we got up to our 10,000 pounds. So again, this is just to illustrate how the computer accounts work. And I want to show one other thing, which is I want to show you the nominal ledger. So in KPM, there's a section for reports. Then in additional, there's the nominal ledger. And the nominal ledger lists our sales and purchases and our bank accounts. And as it happens, if we printed this out, it would also show the stock account, even though the stock account shows nothing. But for each nominal account, you can look at all the transactions that go to make up that balance. So if I want to look up all the transactions as to how I got to my bank account, I can look at it through the nominal ledger. I said, the reason I wanted to show this to you is the nominal ledger is such an important and valuable uh, aspect of accounting. So I just wanted to illustrate that back to you. Okay, and I'm now gonna go back to the spreadsheet to move on to the next topic. So the one thing I, um, uh, yeah, okay. So we've talked about the trial balance and I want to switch to talk about the stock valuation. Stock valuation on the face of it is very straightforward, but there's a couple of challenges, which is really helpful if you know about, and will add tools to your armory if you're accounting for other people to make you more advanced in terms of the accounting support you can provide. So valuation. If we buy stock, buying cars, and every car costs us a thousand pounds, and we sell cars, we know that for every car we sell, it costs us a thousand pounds. That's pretty easy. It doesn't matter what we sell it at. We know that the cost of that car was a thousand pounds for each car that we sell. That works fine in this example. We bought the three cars. The unit price was a thousand pounds. Stock journal, um, we add 3,000 uh, pounds. If we're entering this on a transaction by transaction, oh, sorry, let, let me um, come back, that's another time. Um, next lot of cars, we buy two lots of cars. Uh, they cost us 2,000 um, pounds. The monetary amount of that uh, the stock levels, sorry, start again. We buy 3,000 cars. This, the first three blocks in this are the movements. The next two blocks are the stock levels. So we buy three cars. We have a stock of three, value 3,000 pounds. Buy another two cars, cost us 2,000 pounds. Increased stock of now five units, cost us 5,000 pounds. We sell four of them. We've still paid 1,000 pounds for all the cars. Stock price, got left one car left in stock of £1,000. And this is where the problem arises. The next purchase we have, the price has gone up. Instead of it costing £1,000, it now costs us £1,200 for the car. So one thing we know, if we use our running total, is our total stock units, we've got six items in stock, it's now cost us £7,000, one of them at £1,000, five of them at £1,200, and when you add those all together, that's £7,000. You've got six items, cost you £7,000. The question I have for you is, on the 15th of March, we sell three cars. What's the cost of what we sold? What's the cost of what we sold? when what we bought has mixed pricing. Okay, 
I'm going to show you two answers. There's actually several answers that you can do. And the choice of which, you, which of these methods you use is your choice as an accountant based on what you think works best for the business. And what works best for the business is what best reflects allocation of costs against the revenues in the fairest way. And you have to judge that. Sometimes it's really obvious, sometimes it really isn't. As it happens in this case, it's not really obvious. And so as it turns out, another part aspect of the business you might want to think is how easy is it to keep track of? Because that might have an influence if the decision about which basis you use isn't cut and dry. So the two ways you can do, I'm gonna illustrate here. The first one is actually less instinctive, but it tends to be used more often because computers handle this much better. And that's called the first in, first out basis. And the first in, first out basis says, if your stock prices change, of course, this is irrelevant if they don't change. So only if they change, you've got an issue. But if your stock prices change, use up all of the original cost first, and only then use the higher or the next level cost once you've used up for the, all the first level cost. It's saying whatever stock came in first is the stock that will go out first. So when you come to sell these three cars, three, these three cars, one of them you have bought at a thousand pounds, and two of them you'd bought at 1200 pounds. Now, you probably can do that in your head, but I'm gonna show you a, the way that you would probably keep track of it if you're doing this in a, in a realistic way. And in this calculations chart, I'm separating out a separate column for each price level. So I'm keeping out the stock levels for stock I bought at a thousand pounds and stock levels for stock I bought at 1200, 1200 pounds. So when I bought the cost of the stocks of 3000, I got the three cars for 1000 pounds, I'm saying I bought three of them in the 1000 pounds category. And in total, there's three of them. I bought another two at a thousand pounds, that's five of them. I now sell four of them. I've only got one left at that price. When I then buy the next five cars, I'm buying them all at a new price range. So they're in the next block, the 1200 pound block. And my running total is five of them. So now when I come to sell my three cars, I've got a fairly easy way of identifying which price to allocate uh, to the accounts. One of them I'm gonna do at a thousand pounds and two of them I'm gonna do at 1200 pounds. So I could put in a unit price here, but what I'm actually going to do in this case is put in the actual actual amount of the price, and that's um, uh, two of them at twelve hundred pounds, one of them at one thousand pounds. That's five thousand four hundred pounds. And when I come to sell the final three, all three of those is at the twelve hundred. Uh, price range, so I can actually now put put the twelve hundred pounds in, okay, I've made a mistake. Um, I'll have to uh, explain this uh, have to work this through another time. Um, uh, oh, um, the main mistake I've made is having sold the cars. Um, I should be left with um, stock value of zero. And I've got minus 3,000, so I've just simply made a mistake. Uh, in fact, this is why I've made a mistake, because that should be 3,400 pounds, not 5,400. The 3,400 was the 2,400 for these two cars, 1,000 for this, made the, not put the number wrong in my head, it was 3,400 pounds that we paid. So the stock value, as at the end of after that, three, having paid the three thousand four hundred pounds, was three thousand six hundred pounds, which was the seven thousand we started off with, less the cost of three thousand four hundred we're allocating um, when we sell the car. So although 
each of these is happening in the same month. Imagine these are happening in different months. I've called this column the stock journal because this is the cost that we transfer, we release our stock to the profit and loss account. So first in, first out, you've got the slightly strange situation that we sell three cars on the 15th of March and the cost of those sales is £3,400. In this example, just the day later, the same three cars, yet the cost of the sales is more than that. It doesn't feel right, does it? It feels a bit wrong, but that's what the first in, first out says. And there are certain circumstances you'll find that really suits you well, and certain circumstances that doesn't. It's for you as the accountant to decide what works best. The one thing you can't do is switch from month to month between one basis and the other. There's another principle of accounting called consistency. And once you've decided a policy, you have to be consistent on it forever, or not necessarily forever, but if you change the policy, something pretty significant has to arisen. And there's all sorts of accounting disclosures you have to make so that people know you've changed the basis. And of course, the reason for that is by changing the basis, you'll get different profit figures. And what you don't want to do is to mislead somebody into thinking you've made profits or you've lost money when the main reason is not because of your trading, but because of your changing the accounting policy. And you may remember, remember we um, uh, talked about some of the accounting errors at one of the earlier courses, and we looked at some of the accounts. Uh, you can bet that there were some accounting policies that weren't clearly enough explained, which ended up adjusting or flattering the company's profits. Um, and because they weren't explained well enough, people couldn't adjust for them to get what the true profits would have been. And that caused huge problems at, at a later date. So generally be consistent, don't change the policy, but when you're deciding on the policy, it's up to you to decide what you think works best for the company or the, the business, perhaps in conjunction with the management, you can explain your thinking and they may have some input to the decision. But in this case, it's first in, first out. The other one is actually much more instinctive and that's you simply use the average price. So um, in this case, up until the price increase, everything's very normal. Um, we've uh, got an average price of a thousand pounds and it's a thousand pounds with whatever our stock levels were, we've got three, five or one because we only paid a thousand pounds for each. But now we've bought the next six, we've now got sort of the next five, We've got six items in stock. The total value of those six items is £7,000. The average cost is £1,167. 7,000 divided by six. So when we now come to sell the next batch of stock, we can very easily put the average price in. And if we do the same calculation, our average price hasn't changed because we haven't bought any additional stock at a new price. And then when, again, when we come to sell the final bit, I'm going to use the same price as the, going to use the average cost price. And so that the uh, stock journal is now more comfortable. We've applied the same amount for both of the 15th and the 16th of March of 3,500 pounds. I just want to contrast that with the first in first out basis. With the first in, first out, we first allocated £3,400 of stock to the first transaction and £3,600 to the next. Whereas with the average pricing, we did £3,500 to each because there was no change in the average pricing between the two um, uh, periods. So instinctively, it feels more right. Uh, and there's sometimes, as I said, you'll feel better doing it that way and sometimes not. Notice how much easier it is to calculate the average stock price. You don't have to keep records on an item by item basis. So if you use computerized accounting, a lot of the computers keeping track on an item by item basis is actually quite straightforward. But whether you choose to, or you prefer to do the average cost, particularly if you're doing it manually, it's up to you. Imagine that these are not one day after each other, but one month after each other. You can see you're gonna be recording different profits depending on which basis you're using. That's the way accounting is. There's no um, fixed, um, there's no fixed um, absolute level of profits. You just use your judgment to allocate costs as best you can. 
and sometimes your judgment will give different answers and both turn out to be correct. That's why we don't refer to accounts as being correct, but we refer to them as being true and fair because it's fair. So even though the two accounting methods give you different profits, they're both valid. You can see perhaps why you shouldn't switch from one to the other because how easy for you to choose 3,500 pounds in the first month 3,600 pounds in the second month, and it looks like you're more profitable than you really are. So, um, yes, the final thing I just wanted to remind you is that we've been through quite a performance to keep track of these stop levels. And I wanted to um, identify the unit price was really critical in us identifying what our stock value is at any one point in time. And whenever our accounting period ends, this is the stock value that you put into your accounts. Remember, we've already put the journal through. So all this work is about identifying the journal to put through into the accounts. So it's quite conceivable you'll keep a spreadsheet to keep track of your average cost of stock, for example, you might remember do a stock count. And again, when you do a stock count, the average price turns out to be a much easier way of calculating things than first in, first out, because we don't even know what the first in and first out is. We can't even pretend that we know if we're not keeping track of the records. Uh, so um, the average cost price tends to be uh, easier if you're, if you're not keeping track of a stock on, on a um, item by item level. It's only much easier to keep track of manually um, but what you're doing is you're creating the figures so that you can then create the journals to put through the accounts. And we see that in the trial balance and the sp spreadsheet format and the computerized accounts. Okay, nearly the end, we're nearly the end of this session. And I want to talk a little bit about this other, this strange type of stock called work in progress, about how you value it, um, and tiny bit very briefly about statutory reporting. Right, got a cash book. Um, it's a very typical cash book. Uh, we do things in the normal way. The difference is that this business doesn't sell cars. This business is a building contractor. And the contractor has both got staff on the books and they also go out and employ subcontractors and they invoice at a certain period for, for the sale. Now, building work can go on not just for months, but even for years. So I want to look at a relatively small one where you'll have a contract which probably will never be agreed with anyone. But of course, this is illustrative of any type of service that you provide, an architect, cleaning services, any type of service that you provide, where that service is carried out over a period of time. So in this particular example, I'm assuming that you've built up the costs and you do all the, get everything ready. You can only invoice at the end of the end of the job. You've got to wait to the end of the job before you can invoice. And in this case, the end of the job is March, where we're invoicing 25,000 pounds. And you'll notice I've got another column here for the job. I want to be able to distinguish which job I'm working on. So if I've got three or four different buildings, different plots I'm working on, I need to know what I'm invoicing for and what costs I've got. So in the simple cash book, in February, I pay a contractor 15,000 pounds and all of that money goes onto job one. So in the books, we credit bank, debit, I've got a column here for work in progress, I could just as easily have called it purchases. It doesn't really matter because the journal I put through at the end will reflect what I use and it will correct or remedy the position to reallocate the cost to the correct position. So I happen to have called it work in progress in this case because I know I do so much work in progress work. I'd rather default to work in progress than to default to purchases. Okay, having spent 15,000 pounds on a 25,000 pound job, I hope I'm pretty, the, the work's pretty advanced. Um, all the walls should be up. Hopefully all I've got left to do is the inside work, which I should just finish off after two or three weeks with the work. So in, in the month of March, 3rd of February, 
um, I carry out some salaries, I, I spend salaries, and of the salaries of 10,000 pounds, 4,000 relate to admin. So I'm paying a bookkeeper, I'm paying my marketing people, uh, and 6,000 relates to, 6,000 pounds relates to the job. Remember, what we sell is our services in building, our building services, and the building services on the job will take two, three, four months. In this case, it's two months in the month, month of February and March. And some of the costs I've got at the end of February, I haven't yet had the revenue. So even though I don't have an, the equivalent of a physical car, I have spent money, which I'm gonna get back. And although I can't call it stock in the traditional way, we refer, refer to it as work in progress. It's just simply the way to distinguish the physical stock from the, the sort of services you haven't yet um, invoiced for and which you're carrying forward. So at the end of February, we've got work in progress of £15,200. Then we've got additional costs in March. Job two, £6,000 went to work in progress, £4,000 to admin. Contractor, we paid another contractor. This time for job two, goes into work in progress. We then spent rent on our offices, that's admin. We then sold, uh, we, we invoiced for job one, all the £25,000 on the 15th of March. And on the 16th of March, we paid the contractor another £5,000 for job two. And at the end of March, our bank balance shows we've paid, net paid out £4,000. That's the £25,000 in, plus the various amounts going out. Paid out £4,000. Um, uh, sales of £25,000, purchases nil, work in progress. Uh, work in progress 20,000 pounds and the admin cost of 9,000 pounds. So I'm now going to um, uh, look at the work in progress in more detail and I'm going to look at the equivalent of the stock register we had and I've called this a work in progress register. Now you're going to find with work in progress there's a much more compelling need to keep a register, less so with physical stock much more so with uh, services. And the reason for that is it's almost impossible otherwise to keep track of which job you spent the money on. Because whereas with physical stock, you can very easily distinguish a Mini from a Mercedes, you can't really distinguish 10,000 pounds of salary for one job compared with 10,000 pounds of salary for another. You look at the jobs and you actually don't know which job the salaries are paid to particularly if they were split between the two of them, how much went to job one, how much went to job two. So generally you're always gonna be keeping a register like this. If you use computerized accounting, it's really trivial because the computer do, does this all for you. But in this case, in February, we paid the contractor 15,200 pounds. All of that went to job one. If you remember our salaries in March, 4, 000, we spent out 10,000 pounds, of which 4,000 pounds was admin. 6,000 pounds went to job two. Then we paid the contractor two more amounts than the contractor on the 4th of March and the 16th of March. We sold, uh, we, we invoiced on the 15th of March. Uh, let me just delete these for a minute, if I may. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Um, uh, we sold, uh, we, we invoiced for job one. Remember we invoiced for job one on the 15th of March. So on the 15th of March, we have to release our costs to the profit and loss account. So again, the question I ask is what are the costs? Well, in this case, it's pretty easy. We've only got one cost, it's the contractor. We pay them 15,200 pounds. The whole of that 15,200 pounds goes against the revenue. So I'm going to jump forward to the work in progress trial balance. Again, let me just delete these. Apologies. Um, uh, so we've got the cash book of, uh, I've, I've entered the cash book in um, February and March where we paid, uh, right. right, sorry, let's start again. Um, Okay, I haven't yet entered the cash book. Okay, um, 
Okay, apologies. I did enter the cash book and I, I'd forgotten. The cash book for March, we credited bank and we debited work in progress. I called it stock, but it's actually technically stock and work in progress. And it's a WIP for short, stock and work in progress. That's from the cash book. And the March cash book, again, we paid out net £4,191, of which £20,000 went to work in progress, £25,000 went to sale, £9,000 went to admin costs. Just double check that, uh, £4,000 out, £25,000 to sales, and £20,000 and £9,000 respectively that we posted. So I simply posted these amounts to the trial balance. So as at the end of March, at uh, the end of February rather, we've correctly already got £15,000 in stock and work in progress, even though it's in our register, we could have picked it up from our register, but simply from our cash book, because nothing else was happening, our cash book, because there was only this one entry for job one, and we put that through to work in progress, we actually don't have to make a journal because everything was already recorded correctly. But in the month of uh, March, this £15,000 cost has not been allocated anywhere against the sales. All we've got is the £25,000 of revenue and £9,000 of admin costs. So if we go back to our register, again, it's instinctive and easy to do, but imagine that this was more complicated. We know how much cost to release to the profit and loss account by looking at the total for job one and reducing the 50, the, releasing the whole of it to the profit and loss account because we've completely finished our sale for that month. So in this case, the journal um, is, uh, uh, we want to credit, we want to reduce stock, stock's an asset or de debit or an asset. We want to reduce it, so we credit stock, debit purchases. So let's quickly put that through. We're going to credit stock. It wasn't 15,000 pounds, but 15,200, apologies. Credit 15,200 pounds, debit purchases 15,200 pounds. So our profit is now looking much more realistic because we've allocated correctly the costs against the revenues. And we've got various admin costs. We still got a small profit of about 800 pounds. Very happy with that. Um, so, the idea of this register is as at the end of uh, March, we've got £20,191 in stock. Let's just see. Yep, that tallies with what's on our trial balance because of the way we did our accounting. So no, jo no journal needed on that. And we've got job two. Uh, we, we've got the component amounts so that when we, in due course, invoice for job two, we can then release those funds to the profit and loss account. So this register you can see is almost identical to the physical stock register that we get, but it's more compelling because we have to keep track of it. And we don't have, we don't have the same unit price for work in progress that we did for, for example, buying a car. It's just the total cost that we add up all together, pull them and then release them at the appropriate time. So there's just two other things I want to draw your attention to and then We'll get onto the statutory reporting before we finish. Do you remember I was telling you that we have to value stocks not at cost, which is what we're seeing here. We spend £20,000 of costs, but the lower of cost and net realizable value. Now, in this case, whatever's happened to this job has been pretty disastrous because we're only able to charge. £10,000 for it next month. It could be that the people that contracted the building from us have gone bust. Or it could be that they found asbestos in the roof and we have to remove the asbestos at our cost. And even though we've budgeted to sell for £30,000, it's going to cost us £20,000 to remove the asbestos. That's an example of why our net realizable value might be lower than our current cost. And in this case, I want our net realizable value to be £10,000. I don't want it to be that. That's what I'm being told by the manager. So I have to reduce my stock value from 20191 to £10,000. And I do that by way of work in progress devaluation, a stock write down. 
And in order to get to the right figure, I have to reduce my stock by 10,191 £10, pounds. That brings the stock value from 20,000 pounds down to 10,000 pounds. Let me reflect that in, here, in the ledger as well. So again, our check sum is still zero. I still, the total of all my jobs equals my overall total of jobs when I've added them all up together. Let me put this through as an accounting entry. We've had to reduce our stock by a stock write down, which we're not happy about, but as accountants, we have to reflect reality. And you always account for costs which are not recoverable in the month in which they first arise. As soon as a cost appears, which you can't recover, you have to write it off. So we have to reduce our stock by 10,191 pounds. We credit stock, what do we debit? Actually, not quite so obvious um, because we haven't really bought anything for that 10,000 pounds. We've just written off the costs. Yep, you're quite right. We still do debit to purchases or cost of sales because we're missing the point. It's not that we've incurred a cost of 10,000 pounds. It's that we had carried 20,000 pounds of costs forward, but we now know we can't carry that forward anymore. So we're releasing 10,000 pounds of the cost we've already incurred. So it's as if we had bought it because we had paid the money out. It's very unfortunate, very frustrating. You'll see that, um, that my check balance doesn't balance because of course I put the wrong figure down in here. And now, if you look at the um, profit and loss accounts, we've actually lost quite a lot of money this month because although we've got revenue of 25,000 pounds, we've got 34,000 pounds of costs because we've had to write off 10,000 pounds of, of stock write-off. So that's just killed our profits. Really bad news. Of course, that's why we try to avoid write-offs if we can avoid them. Um, of course, it's conceivable. We might look for a different buyer and we might find somebody else that would pay more than the people we've contracted to buy it with. And it could be we could do some clever deals to reduce that stock write down or even eliminate it. But in this example, no, there's no opportunity like that. We have to write it off. And unless we've actually got a contract which shows something improved position, we can't hope, we can't not write it off in the hope we might be able to find something else better in the future. And the final thing I just wanted to the straight that might happen is we've in our cash book if you remember we spent a certain amount of money on rent and a certain amount of money on salaries now those are overheads and if you remember we said we can charge any costs that relate to bringing stock to its present location present condition and location and let's say we start a job three, and within our salary costs, we've got, for example, some architects uh, who did some planning permission. Uh, maybe that's not such a good example, but let's say we had some sales staff and we paid them to do quite a lot of work. And we're going to allocate some of their costs to job three. So we haven't yet, um, done any specific work on job three, but we've got a lot of stuff ready to do job three. So within our, going back to the cash book, within these admin costs, it's actually completely appropriate for some of those costs to be allocated to job three. And when we've gone and done our calculations, uh, go back to the register, I'm actually going to, I'm very happy that we can, allocate a thousand pounds of costs to job three. So I call this admin allocation. Whenever you're doing an allocation of administrative costs, you have to justify it. There has to be valid reason for carrying the cost forward. Those costs have to fairly relate to future sales where you can identify the specific sales it relates to. That's the only base on which you can carry forward costs. But there's no reason you can't carry it forward just because you originally called it admin, as long as you meet those criteria. And in this case, you would almost certainly want to have an audit trail back to the document that showed how you arrived at your calculation so that you could show that this is a legitimate carry forward cost 
rather than someone just fiddling the accounts, trying to pretend they've got stock, which they haven't got, because they want to increase their profits. So as accountants, we'd never do that sort of thing. It's a criminal offence to fiddle the accounts, to, uh, to intentionally defraud people by misstating what the account figures show in order to persuade them to take decisions they wouldn't otherwise make. It's fraud. Um, so, but in this case, we've got valid reason for carrying it forward, completely appropriate. If you're ever, ever unsure, by the way, you can always ask the accountants, the external accountants at the businesses you're working with, whether it's appropriate to carry forward costs. That's only if you're uncertain. If you're confident, that's, that's fine. If you're confident about it, and the rationale for doing it is about genuinely understand, uh, attributing fair profits, then it's fine to carry these things forward. So again, I'm going to uh, put through this journal, and I'm using the spreadsheet format, but the same would apply equally uh, in the computer format. And I'm going to debit stock or work in progress. And what do I credit? I'm crediting admin because that's where I'm taking the costs from. So if I now look at my profit and loss account, I've still lost money, but it's not quite as bad as it was. So I've now worked out how to value my stock at the lower of cost and net realizable value. And again, just another tip. We know the stock levels are 11,000 pounds in the balance sheet. And the way we've done it, you know very, very well that that figure is valid. But typically when you do accounts, you won't have such a good handle on these figures. So typically you'll have a register where it'll show these three jobs and you've got the component parts of each job. Typically, you need to go through with people involved with the job to talk to them about what the job entails to make sure firstly, we've allocated the cost correctly. We've allocated this cost to job two, but actually if those costs really related to job three, this write down will be extreme, much, much less, and we'd suddenly go from loss to profit. So it's really critical not to misallocate costs to the wrong job. So when we have the register or list the jobs, go through with the people who know what they're talking about because they ought to identify, no, no, that contractor in February was doing stuff on job three, not job two. They'll just know that, or they'll compare it with their budget, say, this doesn't make sense. And you identify errors in that case, but in particular, make sure always that the net realizable value exceeds the cost. Because if it doesn't, as happened with job two, we have to do a write down and we have to do it every month. And if we don't, the accounts will be wrong. Okay, finally, a very simple summary. How do you report stock in statutory accounts? And the answer is really very simple. There's a section for current accounts. And within that, the first item in current accounts is stock and work in progress. And as with all statutory accounts, we show the current year and the previous year comparison. In this case, we have 25,000 pounds of stock and work in progress at the end of December, 2022. And the end of the previous year, December 2021, we have 17,287 pounds. So that's quite an easy, um, uh, quite an easy uh, summary. But let me now come back and summarize what we've talked about today. We talked about stock and stock's one of those items that not every company has got stock. And if it doesn't, you don't have to worry about it. But if it does have stock, it's so easy to fundamentally mistake the accounts if you don't have the correct stock value. So we've looked at what stock is, it's the apportioning costs from one period to another so that the costs are allocated or written off in the same period in which you recognize the revenue. We've worked out how to mechanically to identify what your stocks are. We've identified how to value stocks in two or three different ways and we distinguish stock and work in progress. We've identified how you can even apportion some of the overheads against work in progress, as long as it's valid, and there's quite an, quite an obligation for you to demonstrate it's valid. And then we've identified how to account for it, both in the spreadsheet format and in the computer format, using journals. 
Now, I didn't mention that in computer formats, typically uh, a number of them will have a number of packages will have stock handling systems. And depending on what the system is, it will make your life of managing stock much, much easier if everything's computerized. Well, you can have to work out with each system how it works, but the principles are all based on what we've discussed today. So thank you for listening to the stock module. Uh, this is a really key one. Uh, again, if you've understood this, if you haven't understood it, go back and listen to it again. Perhaps wait, perhaps do a little bit of examples, maybe in your job. And then when you've got a bit better feel, if you didn't fully understand all the concepts, come back and rewatch bits of it just to help, help you re-understand it, perhaps with the different base points, you can understand it better. But once you've understood all of this, again, I think you're really well equipped to do job as an accountant or as a bookkeeper, or to understand what's going on in your own accounts to make sure that those accounts are true and fair. Thank you for listening. Until next time. Bye.